uh, in South Africa is to just make sure that ordinary people understand that there is a reason why South Africa is struggling, the reason why the economy is flatlining. And that reason isn't some sort of a capitalist conspiracy or American spies and whatever. What is the relationship between democracy and human progress? Are freer societies also more prosperous? Well, Marion Tupi of the Cato Institute and humanprogress.org believes that human freedom equals prosperity. We sat down with Marion for a long conversation around his new book, 10 Global Trends That Every Smart Person Should Know. And what follows is an extract from this conversation. Marion, let's turn now to governance issues. So uh, at the end of the Cold War, Francis Fukuyama uh, wrote a book, The End of History and the Last Man where he basically applied a Hegelian framework to say that essentially uh, the liberal democratic ideal had triumphed. Uh, do you think that that is still the case today? And what role does high degrees of human freedom, individual liberty play in driving growth and prosperity? I'm actually quite keen on Fukuyama's thesis. Um, I uh, obviously following the end of communism, we have seen a tremendous flourishing of democracy in the world, whereas in the 70s and the 1980s, autocracies were here and democracies were here. That has completely flipped after the collapse of communism and a uh, greater share of uh, humanity lives in democratic or even semi-democratic states. Uh, than uh, before. Now, we have seen some backsliding, obviously, um, in uh, in recent years. Russia is a good example of a country which had, quite, you know, some limited version of democracy, but now they have just an uh, ordinary dictatorship. And, uh, and it may well be that, uh, um, you know, th th there are going to be countries where democracy is going to uh, suffer even more. But I do not see a full flight from um, democratic decision making, partly because I think that humans are becoming aware via the internet, uh, via the news, etc., that there are places where people are treated better than in autocracies. Um, in other words, if you are, say, a woman in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan, uh, you can see that on the internet that you know, there are women who are better treated in, in the Western world, for example, if you're a gay person um, living in, uh, in a place like uh, Iraq uh, or Iran, you know that uh, gay people are treated much better in, in democracies. Um, and, you know, um, same for, for other types of minorities. But um, so my point is that the knowledge that democracies provide better treatment of people is out there. And it cannot be unlearned because every person in the world has access to that particular piece of information. Also, it's not obvious what are the alternatives to the uh, liberal democratic way of life. Russia is a uh, nationalistic Russian Orthodox uh, ideology that doesn't translate really very well to other parts of the world. China has accomplished a great deal, but we are learning more about the cost that the Chinese government imposes on its people. We've learned about concentration camps. Um, we know that China produces parts of its economic output through slave labor, through that they are uh, forcibly removing people's organs um, and, and things like that. And, and that's simply not uh, the kind of economic system that, uh, uh, that, that has much appeal, I think, at least I hope. And finally, China uh, has accomplished a great deal by mimicking the West, by learning from it, but it is not a place which is innovative. And uh, that's something to keep in mind, is that uh, Western countries have their share of problems, but they are free, and because they are free, they can innovate, um, whereas China can only mimic, because it's not a free place where people can freely interact and exchange information and ideas. So economic growth and um, human well-being are best served by uh, uh, liberal democracy, by which I mean uh, uh, limited government, and they are well served by some version of a free market economy. Now, those, those types of free markets differ. There is a social democratic model in Northern Europe, 
uh, there is the US model, uh, there is the Asian model, but uh, all of them are producing more wealth than, uh, than, than the alternatives. I mean, even China, which is obviously a dictatorship, uh, has produced economic growth precisely because it stopped being Maoist and oppressive and totalitarian, but it embraced a degree of economic freedom in the late 1970s. If you're enjoying this content, click here for a 30-day free trial of the Center for Risk Analysis to access exclusive client webinars and reports. Different regions, different parts of the world have different levels of progress. And certainly the human progress that you've described in today's conversation is truly miraculous. But that doesn't mean that it's inevitable. And the decisions of politicians, policymakers have a huge and profound impact. And I know that in your personal background, you've spent some time in South Africa, you've studied Southern Africa. When we look at the South African context at the moment, looking at stagnating uh, living standards, uh, real GDP growth uh, is flatlining, and uh, the state is taking on an ever increasingly uh, centralized role in trying to dominate the economy. But what is your observation about where Southern Africa is today and South Africa in particular? and what some of the dangers are of this current uh, policy path that we're on. South Africa has a very special place in my heart. Uh, it's still the most beautiful country that I've lived in or possibly even visited. Um, and I wish it well. And I am very worried and uh, I am deeply concerned about what I'm seeing. Uh, South Africa has experienced a number of years, possibly decade or more of economic stagnation that has created an economic crisis, which the left is now using in order to double down on the failed economic policies of the last 10, 20 years or so. Uh, communists flourish most at a time of crisis in the middle of chaos. And the more chaotic uh, South Africa gets, the more likely it is that uh, uh, communists are going to uh, really triumph in these power struggles that are taking place in South Africa, and they are going to impose their uh, insane and cruel vision on, uh, on, on the other people in South Africa. So the key here is, I think, uh, uh, for people like you uh, in South Africa is to just make sure that ordinary people understand that there is a reason why South Africa is struggling, the reason why the economy is flatlining. And that reason isn't some sort of a capitalist conspiracy or American spies and whatever. Um, South Africa doesn't even feature on the radar of the United States. Um, the, the, the key here is that domestic policies of the ANC and of the South African Communist Party have strangled economic growth in South Africa. That's the key. Um, South Africa is overregulated, overbureaucratized, uh, overtaxed, and uh, it is no surprise that under those conditions, economic growth should be low, unemployment should be high and uh, out migration should be high. And uh, so, so the key is, I think, to uh, inform South Africans about it so that when change comes, the, presumably there is going to be one day when the ANC is not going to be in power, uh, or if there is an economic crisis, uh, the people of South Africa realize it was because of ANC's policies. Maybe we should go in the opposite direction rather than go with the ANC toward greater and greater um, economic restrictions and uh, essentially another socialist catastrophe, another socialist collapse. Aaron, that's certainly a cogent warning to us here in South Africa. But let's turn now to the United States. And uh, it certainly seems to be difficult to be optimistic about the United States at this present juncture. Uh, we saw uh, over the last few years, uh, for example, the rise of Antifa on the far left, saw uh, right-wing elements storming the capital uh, at the beginning of the year. So it seems to me that the United States is deeply polarized, unable to uh, really find common ground. Do you share the pessimism of, of some of uh, the people in, in the country in which you live? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult time. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, you know, in the last gosh, six years, seven years, we have, we have gone from a narcissist to an insane person to a senile person. So with, with every new cycle of elections, uh, we, we just seem to be deteriorating in terms of the quality of, of leadership. Um, 
and uh, there, there are rotten parts of the system, no doubt about it. Uh, the, nobody trusts the institutions and the institutions don't trust the American people. That being said, right the year before um, COVID, uh, median household income in the United States was its highest in history. Uh, the economy was actually doing extremely well. Unemployment was at a historical low. Um, the economy was running for an advanced economy like the United States, running at two and a half and three percent is not bad. Um, and uh, and as I said, median household incomes uh, were at its historical highs. So there is a lot of a um, lot of good, um, or rather, a lot of what is that phrase that Adam Smith used about there is a lot of ruin in the nation, meaning it takes a long time for uh, an advanced uh, nation with a lot of wealth to, to deteriorate and to collapse. Um, I'm thinking here places like Argentina. You know, Argentina was one of the richest countries in the world in 1900, and it is still the second uh, richest country in, uh, in Latin America after Chile. Now, the reason for that is because uh, Argentina already was at such high level of economic development relative to its neighbors that uh, that even when it stagnated, um, um, you know, it took a lot of time for others to catch up. And uh, um, in the United States, um, obviously, the United States is still on the cutting edge of innovation. You know, if you want to start a, a noble company and you need a lot of capital, uh, Silicon Valley is where you go, including our fellow South African, Elon Musk. Um, uh, who's become a uh, the richest man in the world, and much more importantly, who who has done tremendous things for for economic progress. But he is in the United States for a reason. It is still a land of opportunity. It is still a land where you can uh, start a business relatively easily, and you can get financing for it from private capital. Uh, but the politics could undermine that politics could really destroy that politics is poison it is a zero-sum game and um, um, certainly the political atmosphere and the greatest polarization of the country is uh, is deeply concerning um, and I do not see it uh, being calmed down in any uh, in, in the foreseeable future so that just shows you that uh, even in a place which is highly developed and has, uh, you know, decades, if not centuries of political stability under its belt, um, things can go terribly wrong. And it also shows you that human progress is not guaranteed. Um, you know, when I talk about human progress, I really talk about it, it is retrospective, it is historical. I can tell you that today people are living longer than they did 100 years ago. I can tell you that people are earning more money than they did, last, uh, you know, 100 years ago. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, poverty rates are lower than what they were 100 years ago. What I cannot tell you is what will happen 100 years from now. I cannot tell you that because I don't know. Uh, I certainly am not uh, Pollyannish, and I don't believe that there is some sort of a higher power or some sort of a force in the universe which is driving us toward towards some sort of a new Garden of Eden or utopia. I don't believe that. I think that we could screw it up at any moment. And it is precisely for the reason that humanprogress.org exists to educate people about the reasons why we have it so good relative to the past um, and why we continue to emphasize the importance of um, limited government and liberal democracy and why we keep on emphasizing the importance of, um, of uh, um, of property rights, rule of law, um, of competitive enterprise, free trade, and things like that. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this analysis, you might want to check out other videos in the series. My name is David Ansara. Please leave your thoughts in the comment section below and give this video a like. Until next time, take care.